Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Very well done. Someone went to Catholic school out there. Okay, welcome to the URI Honors Colloquium. Are you ready for the future? Well, we're on our fifth lecture now, so the question should be, are you readier for the future? We'll be checking in on that on a regular basis. I'm Judith Swift of Com Studies and Director of the Coastal Institute. My fellow coordinators are down here, Peter Cornillen and Chris Roman, both of whom, if you've been a recidivist, you have met already. They are both from the Graduate School of Oceanography. And I have to tell you that after months of working with these two gentlemen, I can say that they carry on the tradition of excellence that's embodied in this, the 50th anniversary of the Graduate School of Oceanography, 50 years of excellence. I want to thank our generous sponsors, in particular the G. Unger Vettelson Foundation and the many sponsors that are listed on the screen right behind me. That's also an eye test for everyone. If you're watching through our live cast, I want to welcome you as well and know that you are missing the conviviality of this wonderful crowd here, but you also do have the joy of knowing that you're going to learn about synthetic biology in your PJs. The exits are to the rear also to the side in the rear, as well as to both sides in the front. Restrooms are in the lobby as well as downstairs. At this moment, please turn off pagers, cell phones, warp speed link-ups, anything that you have. Unwrap your candy and take your Robitussin cough suppressant. Everybody get ready. Our speaker is going to entertain questions this evening, so please send them to HC, and you'll see it right here on the screen, hcquestion at gmail.com, or text to 401-284-7444. Or you can fill out a card using a stylus and papyrus, and they'll be picked up at a couple of points throughout the talk. Now, I will say that... Uh, Dr. Collins has been very gracious in that he has agreed that if we don't get to all the questions we receive this evening, he would be very happy to answer those questions and we will upload those answers to our website, which I think is particularly generous of him. So thank you for that. Um, we only edit questions, by the way, for the sake of brevity or if more than one arrives with the same topic and they can be combined. I want to remind you of upcoming events in case you're going to dash off at the end. Next week we have Jason Dwyer on current and future trends in nanotechnology. We searched for the best speaker and determined he was right here in our own zip code. Jason has a broad view of the depth and breadth of what is a crucial and recurring technological theme in this series, nanotechnology. So be sure to show up next week for his talk. To introduce this evening's guests, we have Dr. Tatiana Reinerson, an associate professor of oceanography, who conducts studies of marine biodiversity using DNA fingerprinting techniques in genomics. She's also interested in how plankton have responded to changes in climate in the past and how they will respond in the future. Published in Science and Nature, funded by NSF, NOAA, and the Office of Naval Research, USDA, the Department of Energy, and with research that has taken her to Antarctica, the Caribbean, Siberia, and Iceland. She's director of the Narragansett Bay Long-Term Plankton Time Series, the longest-running plankton time series in the country. Tatiana? Good evening. So uh, you are in for a real treat tonight. Our speaker this evening is Professor James J. Collins from Boston University, and he is going to share with us his research and ideas on synthetic biology. He has been named one of the top 100 young innovators by the Technology Review and one of the top 50 outstanding leaders in science and technology by Scientific American. Professor Collins received his undergraduate degree in physics from the College of the Holy Cross, and his PhD in medical engineering from the University of Oxford. Professor Collins is the co-director of the Center for Biodynamics. 
He is a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator and a core founding faculty member of the Wyss Institute for Bio Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University. His many awards include a MacArthur Genius Award, a National Institutes of Health's Director's Pioneer Award, and a Rhodes Scholarship. So what does this innovative individual do? Professor Collins is a founder of the field of synthetic biology, which combines the fields of engineering and molecular biology. He and his research team develop innovative ways to reprogram organisms, particularly bacteria, to perform desired tasks, such as sensing chemicals in the environment and breaking up biofilms. Ultimately, these engineered organisms could lead to cheaper drugs, greener fuels, and more effective treatments for infections and chronic diseases. Please join me in welcoming Professor Collins. Much. I want to thank Tatiana for the very nice introduction, and I want to thank Peter, Judith, and Chris for the invitation to talk to you tonight. I'm really excited to be here, and I want to commend URI for putting on such a marvelous public program, and I'm going to take this model back to Boston University and encourage my colleagues to create just such a system. What I want to do tonight is have a little fun with you. Over the next 45 or 50 minutes or so, what I want to do is tell you about what's happening in synthetic biology. I want to give you some context, tell you a bit of where did this field come from. It's only about a decade old, but also give you a sense of where this field is going. What does it hold for the future for us in this room? You know, the field, as I said, it, it really got launched in the late 90s, and it was inspired in part by the Human Genome Project. So in the mid-90s, as efforts were really speeding up to sequence the human genome and the genome of other organisms, molecular biologists began to look around and say, oh my gosh, we're going to have these huge parts lists of all the genes and other components inside the cell. We've got to figure out how they get put together into circuits, into networks, into pathways, and how that leads to insights into biology and disease. They began to turn to engineers. Engineers played very little, if any, role in the Human Genome Project. They played very, if any, role in genetic engineering that came back from the 70s. But they turned to some, including my group, and says, what could you guys do? Could you guys figure out how to reverse engineer the cell? So reverse engineer is a fancy term. You just figure out how is something wired up. So with my student, Tim Gardner, we were encouraged by folks at BU and around the country to begin to think about this. And at the time, there was very little data available about these parts inside the cell. It was as if they wanted you to try to figure out how a radio is wired up by really only looking at the outside of the radio. You couldn't do it. And so Tim Gardner and I ran as fast as we could away from that problem. And it served us to sit back and think, what could we do as engineers? So for those of you who are engineers or have raised engineers or are studying engineering, you'll know there's really two types of kids who declare themselves as engineers. The kids who take apart the radios, they're kind of trying to reverse engineer. You hope they can put it back together. Often they can. And then kids who want to build radios out of different parts or build erector sets. And what they're engaging in is forward engineering. And with Tim Gardner, we realized in around 1998, 1999, that we as engineers could introduce engineering to molecular biology from a forward engineering standpoint. And by that, we realized we could take tools of engineering where we could get schematics or circuit diagrams from electrical engineering, model it mathematically, as often happens in engineering departments in this country, and then see if we could find the parts from the Human Genome Project and other efforts that you could put together into basically plasmids, which are rings of DNA, that you could maybe get inside a cell and see if this circuit, that in this case would be a wet or a biological version of the circuit that an electrical engineer might design for radio, functions in the way that you had designed it to function. Tim and I sat back for a while and said, OK, what would be a circuit simple enough that we could analyze it and build it, but interesting enough that it'd be worthy to build? And we cycled through a whole number of different ideas. Uh, for the young people in the audience who are thinking about going into science or engineering, a key adage is if you want to have a good idea, or have good ideas, have as many as you can, because most of them don't work. Take your time sorting through them. And we sorted through a number of different ones. When we zoomed in on was a genetic toggle switch. This was inspired by electronic toggle switches, or flip-flaps, or RS latches. These are very simple circuits that are memory circuits. 
that are at the heart of all the machines that everybody carries around now. And that is, they're at the heart of digital computers, they're at the heart of iPhones, etc., where you can flip these between a state of zero and one or on or off, which is a tiny pulse. Tim and I sat back and said, okay, how could we build this biologically? And it's captured here schematically. What you have are two genes. So genes are strands of DNA, which when turned on will typically produce a protein. So you've got repressive one is gene one, repressive two is, is gene two. What are shown in arrows are promoters. These are strands of DNA that are basically the on switches for your genes. They're so-called constitutive promoters, which means they always want to be on. Okay, so you set the system up. So both genes want to be on at all times. You set it up so that the protein produced by repressive one or gene one is designed so that it wants to bind to the on switch for gene two, shutting it off. And the protein produced for repressor 2 is designed so it wants to bind to the on switch for gene 1 or repressor 1 and shut it off. Okay? They each want to be on, but they're each trying to shut each other off. Right? So for those of you with kids, it's like you have your two kids in the back of your car. They each want to talk, and they want to shut the other one up. No, you shut up. No, you shut up. Right? They're each wanting to try to dominate and be on, but keep the other person off. So in principle, what you can have with this system, and you can have a reporter gene, which will tell you which side is on, is you can set up the system so that it's so-called bistable. That is, that the system will want to exist in one of two states, either state A, where gene 1 is on and gene 2 is off, or state B, gene 2 is on and gene 1 is off. In principle, we realized from this analysis that you could flip this system between the states by just delivering a little bit of a chemical or environmental stimulus. For example, if you're in state A, gene 1 is on, gene 2 is off, you deliver a chemical that will shut off gene 1 temporarily, this allows gene 2, which had wanted to be on, to come on. Once it's on, it can produce this protein to now put gene 1 and keep it off and stay on. And you flip now from state A to state B. In principle, very nice. Well, what could you do? This is my only set of equations that you will see. But we first did, as I alluded earlier, with mathematical analysis. These are what are called coupled differential equations. Uh, if, in fact... Um, you blocked this term, what you have is, th in this case, it's the time rate of change of U, which is, in this case, the protein being produced by gene 1. V is the protein produced by gene 2. This is a degradation term, so if you block this and just solve this time, this would basically be the amount of money in your retirement account over the last few months. It just decays exponentially. In this case, we have basically different synthesis components of characterizing how the proteins are being produced. You can analyze this dynamically to get a sense for is it feasible to actually build the system so that it's bistable? In this case, the system is sitting where gene 1 is on and gene 2 is off. And here are the systems where gene 2 is on and gene 1 is off. Tim Garner was a PhD student of mine. He and I first went after this. We had no background in molecular biology. Tim studied mechanical engineering at Princeton. For his senior product, he built autonomous helicopters and flew them around the Princeton campus. I came from physics and medical engineering. We, in 1998, gathered up our transparencies and decided to go talk to our molecular biology colleagues to see what they thought. We met with about 10 of them, and our discussions always went as follows. We'd present the work, and we'd say, what do you think? And they'd say, oh, very interesting. Do you think it can work? No. <laughs> and we'd say, well, why, why not? And they'd say, oh, well, you know, the system's going to be leaky. That means, you know, the side you want to be off is not really going to be off. It's going to keep producing protein. It's going to get sloppy. The cell's not going to like what you put in. It's going to spit it out. It's going to interact with the other bits of the cell. The cell's going to die or be sick. And in the end, they would kind of pat us on their head and say, you know, guys, biology is really complicated. Why don't you stick with engineering? Well, we appreciated this was 98. The field did not exist. You're going to be uh, faced with a fair amount of resistance. We turned to the Office of Naval Research. So there's an area that some of you in Newport can appreciate uh, with naval interactions. It's an area that's gone after very innovative science areas for years. Eric Eisenstadt was running a program on genetic circuits, not building them, but just modeling them. I got him on the phone, and I said, boy, Eric, we could really use some money to try to build it. He says, oh, no. I called this guy every month for nine months, and I think by the end of the ninth month, he gave me a half million dollars just so I wouldn't call him anymore. So he says, okay, see what you can do. Well, what the ONR does is that they invite the investigators down to present to their group of investigators uh, after progress is made. In our case, we got the money one week before their first meeting in this program. I couldn't go. My wife and I were going to have our first child. She's about to be born. So I sent Tim Gardner, my green PhD student. He went down, presented work up to about here, and he got torn to shreds. 
There's a Nobel Prize winner in the audience, several others saying, this is absurd. You engineers do not know biology. It's complicated. Stick to engineering. But, but what are you thinking about doing? Eric Eisenstadt called me the next day in the maternity ward. My daughter, Katie, had just been born. And he says, Jim, it didn't go well for your grad student. He said, the poor guy, you're going to have to buff him up. It was, it was horrible. He says, nobody here thinks this is going to work. He said, I think it's going to work, but now I'm concerned that you two clowns are not the guys to get it to work. He said, you need to meet with a real molecular biologist or give me my money back. So I, I don't know how many are from the community, how from URI, for those from URI, and if you're from the community, you can appreciate, universities love it when you get grant money. I'm sure the local newspapers announce big grants at URI whenever they get them. They don't like it when you have to give money back. So a suitable motivation for me to talk to my colleagues, well, who should I turn to? And I turned to Charles Cantor, a real pioneer in genome research, and I said, Charles, here, we got this. And he says, ah, we explained what we had. And he says, I got two comments for you guys. One, that this is a crazy enough idea I think it can work, and two, you two are so naive how hard it's going to be, I put my money on you two guys to get it to work. Well, with that, he opened up his lab to our group, taught Tim some molecular biology, and what Tim did was he got in, he worked on E. coli, so this is the favorite workhorse of molecular biologists. This is not the nasty stuff you avoid on hamburgers. It's basically a neutered E. coli that you can work safely with in a lab. We built plasmids of DNA. These are rings of DNA based on the toggle switch. These are promoters. In this case, it's a gene. It's a repressor, LAC. Here's a couple other repressors, CI or TET. CI, let's focus on that, will want to bind to the PL promoter, shutting it off. LAC will bind to p trick shutting it off, and we use GFP. GFP is short for green fluorescent protein. It was a protein that was isolated from jellyfish, so if you go out to uh, Newport, if you go over to Woods Hole, you look in, you'll see jellyfish fluorescing in all different colors. Well, they actually discovered that several decades ago. They had a Nobel Prize in chemistry just a few years ago for it. It's the key kind of beacon for us to look inside cells to see the circuits that we make, do they function the way we think. We put that as a marker to indicate does it work. Tim got these things built, made several versions, and got them going inside cells. These are real data. He starts at, let's say this is in the off state. He can hit it with a chemical, flip it to the on state, and leave it, and it will stay stable for as many days as we're willing to look at these batches of E. coli. It fluctuates. Molecular biology is very noisy. There's a lot of variability. You can then, in this case, hit this system with a change in temperature and go from high down to low, and it similarly will stay stable. This system has a number of interesting properties for the engineers, the techies in the audience. It has a very sharp switching threshold, which means it will go from the off to the on over a very narrow range of stimulus. So you could use it to sense different things, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And that's captured here, here, at low concentrations of what you design this system to sense. It stays in the off state, and then over a very narrow range, boom, it flips nicely to the top. You can characterize the switching dynamics. In this case, it takes about six hours for this guy to flip from, in this case, the off to the on, but only about 20 minutes to flip from the on to the off. This is basically a chemical problem. I won't go into details, but here it basically just switches off from temperature. When you turn up the temperature on these things, what you do is you can destabilize the protein. So the protein basically gets all mangled and it falls off the on switch, no longer keeping it off, and your system can come on. So in this first example, what do we do? This is an ad that appeared about a year after we published this from Accenture, where they had these fluorescing cells. It was an announcement. Accenture was just spinning out as a consulting firm from Arthur Anderson. Brilliant spin out, one of the best in business. Why? Arthur Anderson imploded a few months later off the Enron crisis. So back in the day, Accenture, before they had Tiger Woods, used fluorescing microbes as their spokespeople. I think they long for these days. Well, anyways, they had these fussy microbes, and then this little newspaper thing popped up. Bacterial tested his digital circuit. Now it gets interesting, is the subscript. And that's exactly what we did. We had designed a digital circuit that could work inside a cell. We were able to reprogram these cells and endow them with a simple form of memory. This is now 2000. 2001 is when the ad came out. When we came out with this, you can imagine that there were many futurists and others getting very excited that now this would open up the possibility of biocomputing. That you could now imagine programming cells, microbes and other cells, to function as computers. And in fact, the first time I presented this work publicly, it was at an amorphous computing, sounds odd, but a term that DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Program Agency, had. And as I'm going through the slides, the audience was very excited. Yay, the BU guys have a biological flip-flop. Woohoo! Biocomputing is woohoo. And I said, oh, wait a second, everybody. And I put up that last slide. I said, it takes six hours for this switch to flip. 
All the air went out of the room. Why? Well, as you can appreciate, the tiny electronic switches that you have in your handheld devices and you have at home on your computers take tiny fractions of seconds to flip. So for that and many other reasons, no time soon in the near or long-term future are you going to have a little computer that says E. coli inside that's going to be driven off of an E. coli-based uh, circuit. Why? You, know, you can imagine trying to surf the web with it, where, let's check the weather, you know, four days later, I don't know, it was snow last week. It's the wrong way to think about biocomputing. The right way is to instead, and I already used this phrase, reprogramming, Katiana used it in the introduction, is that the idea of thinking about using these synthetic or artificial biological circuits as a way to reprogram organisms to create programmable cells is here. It's not only here, it's a big part of the future for synthetic biology. And that's exactly what we realized you could do. That is that with this enhanced capability of both engineering circuits and interfacing it to bugs, microbes, you could take your circuit and couple it to very interesting pathways that evolved for literally billions of years in these microbes to sense different things, as well as to couple it to interesting outputs that had similarly evolved for billions of years. And the first one we went after, and others have, have gone after, are could you create microbes that could be used as whole cell biosensors? So could you program bacteria or yeast, put them on a chip, and be able to put them in the environment, for example, to detect the existence of pathogens? to detect the existence of nasty chemicals? Could you use these to sense the presence of heavy metals, be it lead in your home or lead on toys you're bringing in from overseas? Could you use this to identify nasty chemicals that are in your soil? We decided to keep it easy, and I won't go into details, but we took our switch, coupled it to the DNA damaging pathway that exists in bacteria, and used it to create a sensor that could detect DNA damaging agents, like UV radiation or nasty chemicals. What we were able to show is that you firstly want to have a very low false positive rate for any sensor. That is, you do not want the sensor to go off unless it senses what you want to sense, right? So we all have sensors in our homes. We have smoke alarms. You do not want your smoke alarm going off unless there's smoke in your house, right? You go crazy. And, you know, the, 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 the beeps start going off when you're running a battery. You go a little loopy as you're trying to find which one, right? You don't want that going off. You don't want your biosensor that's in the Providence State Capitol to say there's anthrax here, unless you have anthrax. Well, it turns out these babies are incredibly stable as sensors. We looked out 48 hours on these cells, they never flipped. Then we could deliver, in this case, mitomycin C, which is a chemotherapy agent that nastily damages DNA. And at very small amounts, a small number of cells flip. At increasing amounts, increasing number of cells flip until you can get kind of a readout of how much of the nasty agent is there. And in this case, we actually have it so it's more sensitive than any sensor that you can buy right now electronically. In this case, we're using it to fluoresce. So you could have a signal that fluoresce, say, okay, there's something bad here. You can also use it where you can have biofilms. We're going to come back to biofilms in about 20 minutes, but biofilms are communities of bacteria that are attached to a surface, the plaque on your teeth, et cetera. Here, you can have a readout that when it tenses DNA damage, boom, it flips on biofilms. And so now you can imagine using this to sense UV radiation. I think in the coming decade, we'll have bio-based sensors where you're out on the Narragansett Beach, you can turn to your friends and say, oh my gosh, you've got purple biofilm, baby. You better put some, reapply your sunscreen. As a read to sense, man, it's going to direct read out. You're getting too much of the nasty stuff. What's happening in the field is folks like Ron Weiss, at, now back at MIT and others, are using these circuits and related ones to create very clever sensors that, for example, can give you bullseyes to identify the exact location of the source of either your spill or the location, say, of a heavy metal item. Ron and others, including our group, are now working with ONR to see can we engineer these to sense different things in the oceans, to sense different things in land. One of the big challenges you want to take on is can you use the bugs that are engineered in this way, for example, to identify mines in abandoned minefields. One of the big problems worldwide. You know, the nasties, they'll have a conflict. The nasties lose or die. You've got these minefields where people don't remember or have not kept record of where the mines are. And we don't mind losing a billion bacteria, but you don't want a kid walking with it. So we're now talking to the Department of Defense of how you could use RONs and our schemes to go in to identify these. Another application that I think speaks nicely to the future is in biotech and bioenergy. What you're going to see in this next decade is a few winners are going to emerge from this area of bioenergy, where there's a number of exciting synthetic biology companies that are programming microbes to convert different biomass, probably the most promising are groups that are converting sunlight 
into fuel. What they often do is they basically will grow up a vat of bacteria or yeast in a big reactor, and then once they get to a certain density, they hit it with chemicals to flip stuff on. It turns out that the chemicals are very expensive. And right now, what's holding back this field from having a future impact is that it costs $4 to make $1 worth of gasoline. Not a good business model for any current business folks or former business folks in the audience, right? To get the cost down is really where the game's at. And when Tim and I began this field, folks from Dow and DuPont came to us and said, hey guys, can you program bacteria that we'd put in our vat where they could autonomously are on their own since they reached a density and begin to flip and produce their protein? We saw, maybe we could. And I won't go into the details, but what we did was basically take an engineered pathway that had been taken from one bacterium by Ron Weiss again that's a signaling pathway. It turns out bacteria don't talk with words, but they do signal each other by sending small molecules. And they particularly have this pathway called quorum sensing where they can sense how many other bacteria of the same species are in the area. This basically they each produce a small molecule that goes in and out of their cells easily, and they have promoters, strips of DNA, that will sense the concentration of that small molecule. You can imagine if there's only one or two of you there, you're not going to get a lot around. But if you've got you know, a few hundred like we do here, zoom, you'd get a big signal. Well, anyways, we were able to take that pathway, couple it to our switch, and have the cell, when they reached a high density shown here, boom, begin to produce the protein so that you don't have to use these inducers anymore. And we're now working with a number of biotech companies to see how this can be implemented as part of their scheme. Most of what's happening in synthetic biology, and I know many of you are seeing it reported in the literature, in the, in the newspapers and magazines. The great majority of the effort is at this level. My colleagues in our groups are engineering proteins to interact with DNA to make these circuits. What happened just a few years ago and what's going to be a big part of the future for this field is focusing on RNA. RNA is typically viewed as that which is in between your DNA and protein. So to go from DNA to make your protein, you typically have RNA in the middle. What's happened in the last decade is to recognize that these guys actually have a big regulatory role. We decided to harness this as part of a switch. So with Farron Isaacs and Dan Dwyer, what we did was basically engineer RNA switches for a range of applications. I'll just quickly tell you their idea. What you have, as I've already alluded, is that when you turn on a gene, so-called transcription, you'll produce an mRNA, shown here. A ribosome, which is a beautiful molecular machine, will come in, it will dock on your ribosome binding site, walk along the mRNA, and translate the code of the mRNA into a protein. Farron and Dan sat back and said, okay, we're engineers. What we're going to do is we're going to engineer a strip of DNA that we can place in front of the start of this mRNA so that when it's made, it's designed so that this guy wants to bind and block the ribosome binding site as shown here. So the red will sit there and block the ribosome binding site so that your molecular machine can't chug along and make the protein. So in principle, you should be able to block it. And then they said, okay, but we want to be able to turn it on. You like to turn stuff off, but you also want to be able to turn it on. So they said, okay, we're engineers. Again, can we engineer a small part that when turned on will bind to this, rip it off, expose it in ribosome binding site so you can make protein. I won't go into the details, but these are some of the pictures they were able to predict they could make. Here's that first part where the blue is your ribosome binding site. They could create a cis repressed sequence. This was the corresponding on bit of RNA. And this is what they predicted it should look like when they interact exposing here. And what you show here is the system worked beautifully for these guys. What they were able to do is they could take the system, knock it down so that only a tiny fraction, small percentage of these cells were on but then they could turn it up like a rheostat, like your dining room light, where you kind of turn from either no light or you know, romantic light to got to do my homework light across the full range is exactly what these guys could do. So now I want to highlight two applications, but to give you two applications of this RNA switching related, I got to give you additional context. And that is that not everybody's in love with synthetic biology. Maybe some of you are here who aren't in love with synthetic biology. And what's happened really this past decade, and I think it's been a great engagement with the public and other groups like ethicists, philosophers, lawyers, legal scholars, is that many people are concerned. They're concerned that engineers like myself are running amok in molecular biology and that we're going to, by accident, make something, a constructo germ in my lab that will be really nasty and it's going to escape from my lab and, God forbid, eat Fenway Park, right? 
So it's a big worry that the engineers are out of control. We, have as a community, have engaged the public, I think, at a good level to put things at ease, to talk decently, in most cases, and responsibly about the future of what the future holds. But some cases, people are still concerned. The situation was not helped uh, now about a year and a half ago when my friend Craig Venter announced that he had created a synthetic cell. Some of you may remember this story. What he had done as his group is they had taken and synthesized an entire genome, put it in a bacterium, and rebooted it in a related bacterium and got the cell to live and reproduce, replicate. Well, to Craig's credit, he got Obama commenting and the Pope commenting on the same day on his work. It's a different element of peer review than most of us faculty are used to. Uh, but what Obama did was he also charged his bioethics commission to look at this field. He says, okay, I don't trust. These engineers are running amok. Go take a look at this, and we need guidelines or some recommendations on what's happening. And we as bioengineers sat back and said, okay, yeah, we're going to engage in discussion. And I went down and talked with these characters. But let's directly address it. Let's address this concern that I'm going to build something and my lab's going to build something that would escape and cause harm. So we said, boy, wouldn't it be great if we could, for example, engineer something to address that problem? So could we engineer a circuit that would be designed so that you could endow cells with the ability to count? So that you'd have this put into all the cells you work with so that if they did get out, or you put them intentionally out. So let's say you have your anthrax sensor or your lead paint sensor. You don't want that thing sitting down there all the time. So could you program cells to count to five or count to ten so that after five cell divisions or five days, they commit cellular harikari? They kill themselves. Well, as a first step, we said, okay, let's, let's go after this. And again, I won't go into the details, but what we did was take our RNA switches and basically design circuits that can count. What we have here are daisy chain circuits. So the idea here is that you have to flip one switch to prime the next guy to flip. And what flips them is sensing either a light day change or a chemical that might be a cell cycle protein. And we're showing here is just schematically, you know, you flip it, now this guy's prime flipping, and then in this case, after two, it does its job. Here is after three. These are experimental data, very noisy, but these cells work beautifully, and they operate on a 20-minute to 40-minute time frame, which is about the cell cycle division time for a bacterium. Tim Liu, and that was done by Ari Friedlander in my lab, Tim Liu, who's now a professor of electrical engineering, running a synthetic biology lab at MIT, had a different idea, and what he used were enzymes called recombinases. Again, did a daisy chain, but what we can do with recombinases, a beautiful system is, you can express them, they will take an identifier, go after a specific chunk of DNA, they will splice it out, flip it around, and put it back in backwards. Right? What we're able to do is set this up so that it's initially in the off state, will only be on the off switch if it's flipped, so you can do a daisy chain, boom, boom, go down, and this baby worked beautifully. You get very, very low leakage. And this thing operates on the order of 12 to 24 hours. So you can imagine programming these. So we'll talk about clinical applications just starting in a few minutes. Imagine if you're going to take program bugs to go in to fight a tumor or take program bugs to sense to see do you have a tumor. You don't want those things in you for very long. So if you could program these to count to a reasonable number of either their cell divisions or time period, boom, you can wipe them out. We went further and also showed you could use these to make the harikari switch. What we show here is we use the RNA switches so that it's sensing two different inputs. Once it senses both of those, it expresses two separate proteins that together are equivalent to basically the sword that goes into the bug, and boom, the cells die very, very rapidly. So you could program these to sense different things. We had two interesting responses. One is Obama's team came out and to maybe put you at ease and said this field is exciting, but it's not dangerous yet. Our regulations that are in place that came from the 70s are suitable now. Let's keep an eye on it. But what we need are safeguards, and to our pleasure, they actually highlighted this. They said, we need more of these. We need more safeguards so that if stuff does get out or becomes nasty, you've got this to back up. That was one. Two was the biggest interest we got beyond the Obama team when we published this was a number of biotech companies came to us and said, boy, we want this. And I said, what do you want for this? Is we want it to protect against espionage. So the biotech, particularly bioenergy companies, are very concerned that competitors from another bioenergy company or foreign nationals are going to come in with their little jar, run into their facility, scoop out the secret sauce, and run out the door. So these guys says, we want to program our production organism 
to self-destruct if you steal it. So that if it's out of the vat, it doesn't have the, you know, the extra secret sauce to keep it happy and keep this guy off, boom, it commits karikari and they go, ha, 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 you got arrested for no good. They want further, we want you to go next step, we want you to shred the DNA program this and I said I don't know how to do this and, and I also said man you guys have bigger worries than I do on trying to get my papers published anyways <laughs> there's a lot of interest in weekend and the questions go back to this DARPA is now very interested in these sort of safeguards as this field begins to expand what I want to do over this this next part is really give you a feel I've already mentioned biosensing that has broad environmental applications and health applications talked about bioproduction both from an energy Due to the economics, that field in the future is moving towards specialty chemicals. So if it costs four bucks to make whatever you're making, can you produce something that costs 20 bucks? So in fact, the field on the corporate side is moving increasingly towards specialty chemicals, medical polymers, uh, hard to make chemicals that you otherwise uh, would be very costly. And there is where I think the future will be in this next decade. What I want to highlight is really the area we're very engaged in is that is therapeutic synthetic biology. And that is using synthetic biology for clinical applications. It's impacting the ability to identify where do drugs hit. It's uh, using, becoming impactful in drug delivery. It's getting after actual treatment as well as drug production. We're gonna highlight several of these. The first example is really one of the big applications Tim and I got after. So in about 2002, th th three, four years after we came up with the toggle, we were like little kids with a hammer looking for a nail to hit. We're looking for applications. The field was very young. And we sat back, and now this is six years after we've been inspired to think about reverse engineering. And we realized, BAMO, we might have a tool to make it a lot easier. And that is we realized we could use these gene circuits as probes to go into a cell to turn its different components up or down, measure the response, and from that to try to infer the underlying structure. For the engineers in the audience, the engineer wannabes, latent engineers, this is basically equivalent, again, to electrical engineering of reverse engineering a circuit board. So if you're an engineering undergraduate and you take a circuit class, you have to take a circuit class, invariably the professor will give you an assignment where they'll say, okay, hot shot, how is this circuit board wired up? They hand you a green circuit board with a bunch of components. They don't give you the wiring diagram. What do you do? You run your electronics lab, you turn as many of the components as you can on or off or up or down, and you measure the response of the whole system. You do this a suitable number of times, and from that you try to infer the underlying structure of the circuit. You run back to the professor. If you're at Harvard, you get an A no matter what you show them. At, <laughs> at BU, we use a much wider range of letters, as I'm sure URI does. Um, that's in principle what we did. But to maybe give better context, I know there aren't that many engineers, latent engineers or engineer wannabes, but imagine you just bought a home. It's an old home, and you've got a big circuit breaker box in the basement, not properly labeled, and you have no wiring diagram for your house. What do you do? We all do the same thing. You take your boom box, Put the volume on high, plug it in the kitchen. You run downstairs, you flip the switches till the boom box goes off, you take your masking tape, say kitchen. You run upstairs, you put the boom box in the dining room, you run downstairs, flip the switch, dining room, right? You do this, you get a full first order map of your house. That's essentially what we realized you could do with these synthetic biology approaches. And what we could get outside, out of this, is a network that tells you which gene is talking to which gene, What's the nature of the interaction? Are they exciting each other? Are they inhibiting each other? And what's the strength of the action? We could actually give a number. Why that's important is we realized you could use this to get after a really big challenge in drug discovery, and that is trying to figure out what do your drugs actually do. Okay, it's a concerning thing for many of you to hear because you're outside the medical profession. We don't know how most drugs work. We'd like to know how they work. It would make it easier to develop new ones and improve ones. Companies are really good at setting up and doing chemical experiments to see, does the drug hit what you designed it to hit? They're pretty good at that. What they can't tell you is what else it hits. And side effects, uh, toxicity, it's why it costs $500 million, a billion dollars to develop a drug, because these things hit a lot of stuff, and you don't find that out till often later in development. It turns out in many cases the activity is due to the fact it hits a lot of things, and oftentimes a drug will find an application for which it was not designed. The short message is we realized you could use these networks to identify how a drug acts. And it goes again to control theory. I teach undergraduate control theory to my biotechnical engineers every spring. From lecture one to lecture 27, I emphasize soon there's three parts to a control system. The input, the output, and the system itself. If you know two of the three, you can work out the third. 
So imagine you have a drug under development that you don't really know what it's hitting. So you don't know the input to the system. Well, you can take that drug, drop it on your favorite cells, bacteria, yeast, mammalian cells, measure the output. This would be a measure, a so-called microarray data that tells you which genes are turning up and which are turning down in response to the drug. Take that, filter it through your network, and you can predict what did that drug hit to produce that pattern. We apply this to look at antifungals. We apply this to look at mammalian drugs, hit it really well. What I want to tell you about over the next few minutes is an area we're very excited about where we think synthetic biology and related systems biology can have a very big impact, and that's antibiotics. Looking to the future, this is one of the scarier issues, I think, health-wise, for the next decade or so. And it's captured very nicely in the slide here. The number of resistant strains is growing dramatically. In the past, these were largely limited to hospitals. As I tell my students, worst place to be when you're sick is a hospital. You people like, sick, get out of the hospital as fast as you can, because these nasty bugs will get you. Many of us have friends, relatives, who went in for XYZ, and they die from pneumonia or resistant strain. They get all this nasty stuff. Well, this stuff is no longer limited to hospitals. It's now out in the environment, at your gyms, at your preschools, all over the place. These, guys, these bugs are out there and getting stronger because we're overusing antibiotics. This, unfortunately, is coupled with the plot on the right, where the number of antibiotics, new antibiotics, in the pipeline are being approved is dramatically dropping. Pharma is leaving the biotech, uh, the antibiotic era. Why? Economically, doesn't make sense to them. You take antibiotics typically for two weeks, then you're clear, shoom, they're pretty cheap. They, instead of going after chronic conditions, cancer, diabetes, and I, I don't knock them on that. That economically makes sense. But they're also going after lifestyle drugs. So a stunning fact that a colleague of mine shared is that there are more Viagra-like drugs in development than there are antibiotics. It says a lot about our community. I'm a positive guy, so now I look and say, okay, while some of us may die from a resistant bacterial infection, at least we'll have a smile on our face. Well, <laughs> with not that as motivation, but to try to keep us from dying, we used our network analysis systems and synthetic together to build large-scale networks in bacteria. This is an E. coli. And what we were able to do was look at antibiotics to see, is there something new there to be discovered that we could commandeer to make them better? Antibiotics have been around for uh, the lifetimes of almost everybody here. There's a few who maybe beat them out a little bit. Uh, we generally think we know how they work. It turns out we didn't really know how they work. So what we did was look at things like ciprofloxin, cipro, which is thought to inhibit gyrase, mess up DNA, boom, the cell dies. We looked at gentamicin, which is an amino glycoside, which is thought to mess up the way proteins are made, boom, that's how cells die. We also looked at things like penicillin, which mess up the making of the protective cell wall, boom, that's how they thought they act, how cells die. Using this synthetic approach with our engineering, we discovered that these bugs actually respond in a dramatic way to these antibiotics where they basically produce oxidative stress. So many of you are taking blueberries or pomegranate juice to get away from your oxidating agents, to take antioxidants. The bacteria need them in the face of antibiotics. Why? The antibiotics stimulate hydroxyl radicals or reactive oxygen species, and it's that which is the key killing thing. We then went in and said, okay, could we exploit that? If all antibiotics are producing oxidative stress, and the oxidative stress is what's killing, if you block the way the cells protect themselves against oxidative stress by blocking DNA damage, could you make existing antibiotics better? Well, the answer is yes. When we block the DNA damage, we can make Cipro, Gentamicin, Penicillin, you name the antibiotic, we can make it 100 times, 1,000 times, sometimes 10,000 times better. Further, we can suppress, not eliminate, but suppress the emergence of resistance. It turns out antibiotic resistance often arises because these cells damage the DNA. The cells try to repair, they make a mistake, the mistake turns out to be good. Oh, yeah, that's pretty good gives them an advantage against the antibiotic. Well, we wanted to see, could you find a small molecule? We did a big amount of screening with groups at Harvard and BU and actually found some small molecules that on their own did absolutely nothing to the bugs. But when you combine them at non-toxic levels with things like gentamicin, cipro, or penicillin, improve their killing by a thousandfold. And so now we're working very hard to see, can you get this driven from a synthetic biology approach as a means not to find whole new antibiotics. We think we've got a good arsenal, but we've got to turn and get people behind them to make them stronger. We did another very cool synthetic biology approach in this, and it's with Tim Liu in my group, is that we engineered bacteriophage to do very similar things. So bacteriophage, and we'll talk about it for the next few slides, are viruses that specifically and only infect bacteria. So we thought as engineers, could we engineer these guys so that they would be designed 
so that they would go in and overexpress a protein to similarly keep the DNA damage systems off. So we have these guys, they go in, they do nothing to the patient, but they mess up the bacteria and boom, we found that we could significantly enhance the killing efficacy of all antibiotics. And we even show this in a mouse. We did kind of the first mouse study in synthetic biology. We showed, we, gave, we infected the mice, we gave them an amount of drugs so that only 20% lived, and then when we delivered the antibiotic with the engineered phage, boom, we got 80% of them living. We were a poor lab at the time, so we didn't do dose studies. We think we could easily get this to 100%. When we published this, we got contacted right away by the U.S. Army and Walter Reed Medical Institute. So as many of you may know, our soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan are returning, many of them, with very nasty skin infections that have resistant infections from a bacteria known as actinobacteria. Our antibiotics don't work. So they contacted us and said, hey, we want to work with you on engineering bacteria phase, specifically go after those guys so that we can topically add this to help the soldiers. And we're now working with them to develop that, and we're actually very confident, given that we've now identified phage, specifically actinobacteria, that we'll be able to help out. Another synthetic biology scheme, same thing in this kind of infectious disease. It's a great area because, as I'll allude in the next few slides, synthetic biology has primarily focused, and microbes, is this idea of going after biofilms. I mentioned this earlier. Biofilm is a community of bacteria. They're encapsulated in a matrix, a tough matrix. They're attached to the surface of your teeth. They're on the side of a ship. They're the gunk in your sink. It turns out these guys are highly problematic. Why? Bacteria in biofilms are a thousand times more resistant to antibiotics than free-swimming bacteria. So, if you go in for a medical implant, artificial knee, artificial hip, a pacemaker, a defibrillator, a brain stimulator, your number one risk now is not the surgery. It's that you will develop a biofilm infection that they'll need to reopen you up. For example, remove your hip, artificial, clear the infection over the course of two weeks while you sit in the hospital bed without a hip and reintroduce the hip. Nasty because the antibiotics don't work. So we decided as engineers, could we engineer the bacteriophage to go after the biofilm? So let me tell you first on what we did. It was a two-prong approach. So your bacteriophage is this little lunar module. This is actually what they look like. They look like a little lunar module. They will dock onto your bacteria, and they'll blow their DNA, which is inside the module, into the bacterium. Now your bacteriophage can follow one of two paths. The nice path is called lysogeny. So in lysogeny, the bacteria, the, the bacteriophage DNA will just tuck inside the genome of the cell and do nothing. It's as if you have a nice house guest at your house. You don't hear from them, they're quiet, they go to bed early, but, but they don't do very much. That's nice. The other is lysis. Lysis is when they come in and now it's at their bad house guests. They're like college students. They eat all your food, they reproduce, and they explode your house. So in lysis, the bacteriophage will come in. They will now harness the machinery of the cell to make multiple copies of themselves, eating up all the resources. And when they get enough of them, boom, they burst the cell, and now you've got a whole boatload of more bacteriophage. People have tried to use this for going after biofilms, but the challenge is that uh, it's very difficult for the phage unmodified to penetrate the matrix of the biofilm. So as engineers, synthetic biology became and says, ah, we're going to engineer these guys, reprogram them, so they express on their surface an enzyme that will break up the matrix of the biofilm. So you have a two-prong attack. These guys will come in, they'll infect, make multiple copies, but while they're infecting, they're also breaking down the biofilm and exposing more and more bacteria, lower for the attack. And it turns out these things work beautifully. Here's a gunked up plate in our lab with biofilm, cleared it with our enzymatic phage, here we show if untreated biofilm, you drop a boatload of a nasty antibiotic ampicillin on it, you get about a 20% drop, not very much. You drop a large vat of active cellulase on it, you get a 50% drop. Phage unmodified does okay, but not great. But we get 99.99% clearance of the phage, with, of the film, biofilm with the engineered phage. Tim Liu went in and he also did a Trojan horse version. Where he said, okay, let's not just have them express the enzyme on the surface. Can they harness the machinery, make a boatload of the enzyme to break apart the, uh, the biofilm itself? He got beautiful results. He and Mike Curris, both of my lab, launched a new company, Novophage, which I think is going to be uh, a part of the future in biotech. They initially were focusing on therapeutic applications. They're now moving that out into an a, a offshoot of the company, and focusing on clearing biofilms in biotech. Air conditioners, so Legionnaire's disease is a result of biofilms in big air conditioning systems. They're looking at paper mills. They're looking at oil gas pipelines to look at 
corrosion resulting from biofilms. It turns out that many of the leaks is a result of these bugs getting in there and eating away at the pipes. So I'm very excited as to what that holds for the future, both from an environmental standpoint, but as well as human health and economic cost. As I alluded, the great majority of synthetic biology for the past decade has focused on these microbes. They're easier to use. They've got small genomes. You can do experiments. It takes only a few weeks to really get results. It sounds like a long time. It is. It can be very frustrating. The big future in synthetic biology is moving from microbes that have been sequenced to higher organisms that have been sequenced. This is actually Craig Venter, who sequenced his own genome as part of the Genome Project. Now it becomes very, very challenging. What we did was, among other things, was to see, firstly, could you make a genetic toggle switch that worked in mammalian cells? The initial one was bacteria. We burned through two postdocs, which may not mean anything too much to the, to the folks from the neighborhood visiting today, but basically these are very senior level research scientists who spent each three years in my lab hoping to launch an academic career. They could not get this thing to work. We ended up finding other products with them, but spent six years, couldn't work. Tara Deans came over from a PhD program at Harvard, Decides she wanted to be an engineer. We have a great program at BU which allows you to mutate and transform from biology or other areas into engineer. She says, Jim, I want to join your lab. Come a bioengineer and I want to go after this problem. And the short message was, she says, oh, let's not do the toggle. Then the challenge is that you couldn't get it tight off to make a toggle. I won't go into the details and the dynamics of that. But she says, let's make half a toggle. It'll have plenty of application. And what she did was come in and basically make a mammalian switch that shuts off the system with a repressor protein like you saw on the bacterial system, but also uses a whole nother scheme of RNAi, where if any kind of protein or mRNA leaked out, boom, she can knock that down. The short message is, this thing worked beautifully. On its own, these guys each got about 85 to 90 percent knockdown. Terra's system got greater than 99.99 percent knockdown. So if there are any biologists in the audience, you can appreciate that's a very, very high amount. She could flip this baby on, flip it off, and as I alluded earlier, this could act like a rheostat. She could tune it from effective true off and tune it up to very high levels like you would with the light in your dining room. As a demo of this, Tara took on a real machismo, macho demo where she said, okay, I want to see if I can grow up cells for several weeks, keeping it, using the switch to control diphtheria toxin. So diphtheria toxin is a toxin that even with a single molecule of express will kill off a cell. So Tara took on this challenge, and it was great, probably the better, the biggest macho experiment ever done in my lab. She had this baby, and these guys grew up happily. The cell truly had it, the switch truly had this, the protein in the off state. But then she could flip this on. And this system is now being used by about 900 different groups, and many looking to the future are now using these to get after very interesting animal models. Animal model means you're going to engineer a, an animal to study a certain process. One area that we don't have a lot of good understanding on is the aging process, which may be of interest to many in the room, and age-related diseases. And what groups are using is that you can use so-called tissue-specific promoters with this. So you can grow up your animal happily, doo -doo -doo -doo, and then kill off certain types of neurons. Kill off brain cells, kill off muscle tissue, certain and thereby mimic certain disease states. And it's a, it's a beautiful tool that I think is opening up the future for many interesting applications. Terra system can also use, because it's a rheostat, to explore are there threshold responses. Many of us in the engineering world, when we first got into this a decade ago, thought of genes as just being on or off. And in fairness, several of my like biology colleagues thought the same. That, change, that has changed dramatically in the last decade where we can appreciate that many of the differences between us in this room are due to just slight differences in expression of genes. And in fact, the difference as we get older or we experience disease is often slight differences in genes. Not that one goes on or one goes off, it's that one is now instead of only on for a little bit, is now on a lot. And Terra's system is being used to explore this. The last example to talk about is an area that you may have heard if you were here last week from Tony Atala, and that is this whole exciting promise of induced pluripotent stem cells. This is a great area in regenerative medicine. It's one of the big future directions in clinical medicine and synthetic biology is beginning to have an impact. What happened about five years ago is Yamanaka and other colleagues discovered that you could take adult cells, whack them with only a small number of proteins, four, and by hitting them with the four proteins, you could have them go back into an embryonic-like stem cell state. So stem cells are cells that can typically become any type of cell. In the past, prior to this, it was thought that 
adult cells that have already become skin or muscle can no longer go back to that stem cell state. But Yamanaka and others showed that you could do that by expressing these. And now the hope, as I'm sure you heard from Tony, is that now you could take cells from a patient, reprogram them, and then make them into something that the patient is lacking or to make them into something that is not working as well in the patient. In this with George Daly, our group actually worked out that you could take blood from a patient, from a human, and make it into their own stem cells, which now makes it very easy to make needed stem cells. The application we did in synthetic biology is again with George Daly and Derek Rossi, is that one of the problems with induced pluripotent, there's actually many problems with induced pluripotent stem cells. There's many challenges for engineers, molecular and cell biologists like to address. But one is that the way they typically introduce those proteins is they use what's called a viral vector. So you'll often introduce, use a virus to introduce copies of those genes into the genome of the cell. It turns out cells don't like that. They've been now rearranged or changed. We talked about a bit of this uh, with the students earlier today at a reception. They don't like that and you get, as a result, tumors being formed. What we're able to do from a synthetic biology standpoint is come in and actually just introduce the mRNA, you just, the stuff I've talked about already a few times in this talk, and let the cell's machinery make the proteins and zoom, we get them made at 100 times higher efficiency and a very quick time. And we're very confident that this will turn out to be a very useful way. And what our group is now doing from a synthetic biology standpoint is figuring out how you can use synthetic constructs to deliver these to the points of injury or the points of disease or points of aging inside a patient so that we think probably within 10 years, we'll have demos within the next year, in principle you could reprogram a person's site of injury, say it might be a spinal cord, change them at the site back into stem cells and then stimulate them to differentiate back into the needed nerve cells that have been messed up as a result of the injury or disease. Many, many applications to go. I've highlighted the functional genomics. Let me touch briefly. I think the cell therapy and, st and stem cells will do the cell therapy to focus is another area that's coming. You again saw organ level work from Tony. What I think we're going to see increasing in this next decade and two decades is efforts where we're going to take cells out of patients, reprogram them, not into stem cells, but into cells that are going to produce different proteins that you need and reintroduce them. It's similar to gene therapy of a decade ago, which is an area we were very excited about for SynBio, and then that field imploded on itself in part due to some poorly run clinical trials. In each of these areas, once they figure out how we can safely get those cells in your body, one of the big challenges will be how do you regulate those genes you put in? Right now, and before we did this work, there were already gene switches. They were available. You buy a catalog, again, for engineers or people who like to buy stuff. If you're a molecular biologist, you get catalogs, you can buy stuff, the big, thick things, and you could open up and buy a genetic switch, but they were all pressure switches. That means that you needed to have a chemical present always to have the gene on or have the gene off. So from a patient's standpoint, those switches would mean you'd always be having to pop pills. Boop, 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 boop. The toggle switch says, ah, no. It's not as if you come in this room, you've got to keep your finger on the light switch as you would for a pressure switch. The toggle switch is like you have here. You come in, you can flip it, translate, boom, you have the lights on. And so the idea would be that a patient doesn't have to take the pill all the time. The patient only has to take one pill. Flip it on, and then if you need to flip it off, they take another pill after some period of time. Well, when Tim and I came up with these ideas now 11 years ago, we went to a number of pharma companies and presented this as the idea to them. Well, we did not get a nice response. They basically said, God, what's your business mind? I said, what are you talking about? And they said, you're not consistent with our business mind. I said, what are you talking about? I said, this is great. Patient compliance, they don't have to worry. They don't have to take it as much. I'm sure many people in this room take many pills every day. You're worried, you take, did I take this one? I said, they don't have to take as many. They take one. They don't have the complications. Says, God, we sell pills. <laughs> this is a true story. I said, what? I said, I said, we just charge a lot of money for the one pill. He says, no. And they call us a taxi. But <laughs> we do think that these and related will be very, very important as cell therapy takes off. And probably the more important, we'll kind of go back to that cellular harikari, that we think it actually will turn out to be in a very important safety switch. So particularly from a gene therapy, even the cell therapy, in many cases, you're going to get this stuff into people's bodies. We don't have great means to get it out. And imagine now if you have a therapy that's supposed to help you, and it doesn't help you. And we've all had some experience like that. But now imagine you're stuck with it. Well, we think the FDA and others will like these types of switches where you can flip the construct off by taking a pill. And maybe you have to reset it every few months with another pill. But you don't have to take pills every day to keep off something that was supposed to help you. 
Last bit is this idea of microbiome reengineering. I think this is one of the more exciting areas for the next couple decades in synthetic biology. This is this idea that we can re-engineer the microbes that make up our bodies. We have 100, about 100, 10 to 100 more bacterial cells in our bodies than we do mammalian cells. Pretty stunning. I was, I, wow is my response also. It's only about 4% of our body mass, so you're not, you know, you can, you can see it friend. I know what bugs me about you now. No, it's you've got these guys, and we're increasingly, as we're now cataloging these bugs and sequencing them out, is appreciating that they play a major role in our health, they play a major role in our disease. That they think there's roles of the bugs in aligned Crohn's disease, different allergies, asthma. And we're now working, as many in the field are working, to reprogram the bugs to produce what's missing, if it's, it's key protein or an oxidative stress protein, as well as using things like phage now for gene therapy for bacteria, where it's now souped up probiotics, if some of you I'm sure are taking probiotics in this room, where now you take it, you could reprogram your gut floor to rebalance the scheme. And it's an area that I think has much, much to offer for our health uh, and also our economy. Let me just end. I have a great, great network of brilliant young people who do all the work that I get to share with you today. And with that, I want to thank you again for coming out, and we'll turn to questions. I'd like some of those. <laughs> we're gonna have we're gonna have little sample petri dishes up here at the end of the talk. Um, so here's here's a question. Now some of these you have answered in part, so feel free to skip ahead wherever we get. Uh, will we eventually be able to stop the process of aging with cellular reprogramming? That's a really good question. I I don't think we'll be able to stop the process in a human. Uh, anytime soon, let me qualify it to give anytime soon, because it's such a complicated multifactorial process that I think is a consequence of the fact that you're living and you're subjecting yourself to a fair number of stress. I do think that we soon will be in a position to slow it dramatically. For example, there is a, a very well accepted notion that oxidative stress plays a key role underlying aging. And as we develop more effective antioxidants, I think we can impinge those. I think we similarly seeing efforts to go after things like telomeres and other aspects that have been shown to be associated with aging that will appear within the next decade. But I don't think we'll stop, but we should be able to slow the aging process. We'll take that. Yes, everybody? I should, re I should remind you, Jim, that these questions are coming from folks out here and some of our folks that are on the live cast sure. as well. Um, how is the USA positioned relative to the rest of the world in this field, given the state of our politics and regulatory environment? That's a great question. I, I think we're very well positioned right now. Uh, the United States has led the field, both from its founding and its current state. Most of the major centers are here. I don't think the regulatory aspects have hindered us in any way, as of yet. Uh, but I think we're, we're at risk of losing pace. Uh, you see a number of countries around the world ramping up efforts in synthetic biology. You hear people say that this is the semiconductor industry for this century. I think it may be a bit of an overstatement given where we are, but it, it could turn out to be true. The country that I think is putting the most into this field and probably should cause concern for our elected officials is China. Mm -hmm. So China is committing hundreds of millions of dollars to synthetic biology. They're trying to ramp up training programs. They want to get into the industries. They see, as I've alluded, that synthetic biology is, going to, is impacting energy, health, the environment, broadly commercialization, including could impact defense. So right now, we are the leaders, but we could fall back if we see significant cuts in research support. Interestingly, the Department of Defense is probably now becoming the biggest backer of synthetic biology, maybe now second to Department of Energy but I think they soon will be overtaking the Department of Energy. Okay, um, you've already spoken to this in part, but let's, let's ask it anyway, and then you can pretend you're responding to Congress. Oh. Um, so we'll take it at that level of uh, simplicity. How's sure, that? Yeah. Um, how do you evaluate the risk of these program cells running out of control? 
That's a great question. I got that question from the President's Commission, which was not in Congress, but it felt like it was a congressional hearing. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting point, um, and, and I should qualify by saying a few things. One is, as I alluded, we work with highly neutered cells. That is, our cells would be the type that would get beat up if they ever stepped outside our lab. They couldn't survive. They're made to basically be catered to. They're like a spa treatment in our lab. And so, at least at the level, the great majority of labs that are working on, uh, they would not do well if they ever got up. Second is that most of the stuff that we try to do does not work. And it's many reasons, one of which is cells are complicated, my biology colleagues were correct. And that it turns out that we have never seen, so that, in fact this was one of my responses to the President's Commission, we have never seen a mutation that made a circuit, work, a mutation arise naturally that made a circuit work better. If anything, what we've seen is mutations that make the cell, the circuits work worse. That is, once you st stick this stuff in, cells don't like to have stuff turned on inside them. And they're working, they, they don't work, they basically prefer to have mutations occur that shuts it off. It gives them an advantage compared to the cells that have it. With all that being said, right now there are regulations that were put in place in the 70s as a result of recombinative DNA research, which is the basis for synthetic biology, where you have different levels of safety, one, two, three, or four. And right now those levels are appropriate for all that we're doing in synthetic biology, where you come in and say one is where you're not going to get sick from working with the schemes. If you ate a large amount, you might get sick. Two, you could get sick. Three, you're really going to get sick. Four is the nasty stuff you go in with the bunny suits with negative pressure. What I brought up to the commission, and I would bring it up to Congress, is that in a, a scenario that could happen in the future, within the next decade, is that you could have efforts where you're working in a BL1 lab with a BL1 organism, and you modify it so that it really should be BL3. That is, now it's a nasty one that could cause you harm or do harm. You intentionally did it. Now that's where the oversight needs to come in to say, okay, what's your end point? And right now all the regulation is really off your starting point and what you're going to change. The example I bring in, it's a cute one, but it could be a scary one, is imagine that you're trying to engineer bacteria to degrade plastic. So plastic broadly is not biodegradable. So your bugs, biodegrade means basically it's your bugs. The microbacteria are going to eat it up. Generally not. Imagine that you engineered E. coli to eat up plastic. Imagine you made a highly efficient strain intentionally or through a combination of rational approaches and evolutionary. And now you've got this stuff that can just gobble up plastic. And you're working in a BL1 lab. BL1 lab, you're supposed to have a lab coat on most of the time. You don't. You get a little of this bug on your lapel. You go up to your car, you drive home, the bug jumps off your lapel into your car. You wake up the next morning, you basically have your leather seats is all that's left. Most of your car is plastic. <laughs> it's a scenario where I think as you think through what are your end goals, you'd have to adjust. But for now, I think that, and, and it was a conclusion that I supported that the President's Commission came out with, our regulations are appropriate right now for what we have. Mm -hmm. But that can change in the future relatively soon. Does this work pave the way to controlling human behavior for better or worse? That's another great question. Uh, potentially, yes. That it could lead to means where you can modify human behavior. What I think we're going to see in this next decade, and let's go in the next two decades, is an increased appreciation for the role that our genes play in our behavior. And an increased appreciation for the role that our genes play in our personality traits. I, I think it's one that's, you know, it's nature versus nurture. I think it's, it's been underplayed. But I think that much of what we have is hardwired when we come in. If that's the case, you can imagine having the ability through this field to modify human behavior, control human behavior. I think, and you'll hear from Ed Boyden later in this series, if, and I strongly encourage you to come listen to Ed. He's a great speaker and doing brilliant work. I think we'll see much bigger impact in the next two decades from the device end for controlling humans, or having the ability to control humans. And we're already seeing that there are means to control humans through electrical or magnetic stimulation. But genetic means, yes. I mean, I think maybe broadening it from control to modify, I think an area that will be fascinating to watch and track is to what extent can different countries use approach to synthetic biology to boost the athletic ability of their national athletes. That right now, you, know, you, have the, you have chemicals that can come in, you take them, and it's basically my chemistry against your chemist, 
right? I'm going to try to soup up, then you've got to get the defense, and you've got this guy trying to sense, did, did you take what you take? That if you now can modify somebody's genes synthetically, it's going to be much harder to detect. And I would speculate that that effort is already underway to do this. No doubt. <laughs> okay. Um, how would you suggest speeding up the whole cell sensors to make them more practical in everyday life and in national defense? That's a very good point. I think, I think what's needed is uh, a better engagement with the commercial sector. So what we do really well in academia is train students, it's probably our number one goal, and the second is to come up with cool ideas that are at best proof of principles. And that in most of the efforts, even in the most applied academic work, it's basically pre-prototype work. What we need, and I do think this is an area that has, has real benefit, you need to get companies that would get behind it that have appropriate funding, have appropriate teams who are directed towards specking out, getting a product that has standard operating procedures, et cetera, to go after it. And we have not seen as much of that yet. What happened five years ago, four to five years ago, in the face of $4 gas, which is the first time we saw it, the Fed's turning, you had large oil, most of the attention turned to bioenergy and reprogramming organisms to convert different biomass in particular sunlight into fuels of interest. The light, no pun intended, is being taken away from there to now look at other applications. And I think the commercial sector is what could benefit us tremendously from moving these and related ideas from PowerPoints and publications and good journals into devices that you can use around your home, in your backyard, or in your body. Now, you referenced Anthony Attala earlier in your talk, so we have a question that combines some interesting stuff here, which is, could we combine the 3D printing of organs, as was discussed by uh, Dr. Attala last week, and cellular programming to essentially print out new, never-seen-before organisms? So... Uh I, you know, uh, I suspect that we certainly could print out... Or, so, organ is basically biological tissue that has a certain biological function. That's the definition. So, I guess by that definition, absolutely, you can imagine... I don't think you need to use 3D printers, but that you could definitely imagine using that or related efforts in tissue engineering, couple of synthetic biology, so that you could endow cells that then operate in tissues to do new and different things. Related to that, there is a lot of effort now growing in synthetic biology to basically create artificial pancreases, biological versions, to help diabetics. Now there, it's an organ that we already have as a known function. But there, we're just playing around with function we already know. So certainly, I think you're limited in your imagination. And I would encourage folks out there to think through what would be cool for you to have. So I uh, just did a piece for a new biology textbook that's for kids, and they wanted to have a little offshoot on synthetic biology. And my co-author put in, I, didn't, I wasn't that happy with this, but the idea of could you program humans to have sonar abilities like bats? So now in this case, it would be an organ, or based on an organ that does exist, but we don't have. I don't necessarily feel inspired to go back to my lab and rush and try to do that, but you can imagine as you all think through possibilities that you know, th this opens up really uh, unlimited possibilities of saying, oh, let me take this, let me take that, let me take this, and put it together into new and different ways. And that's really at the heart of this whole concept of engineering biology. We're right now primarily focusing at the component level. Let's take this component from this guy, this guy, put it together to do this. As you move up, as efforts like Tony's doing and Bob Langer and Joe Vacanti, I, I think we'll see the merge of the two fields within the next decade. Uh, we're going to take one now, which uh, came in in, in, a, in a very interesting fashion on paper oh, and look pencil. At that. Um, you said humans are 4% mammalian. Is any part of us more mammalian? For example, the brain. That's a good question. So let me qualify. It, it was that our mass, so our weight, 4% of our weight is microbial. So 90% of your weight is human. So the majority of the actual material is human. The number, so it was that there is 10 to 100 times more bacterial cells, which tend to be much, much smaller than humans. Uh, I don't know the answer to the question, which, of us is, which parts of us are more uh, human. I expect the brain might be the best bet to vote on. You know, you, you generally do not want to get a bacterial infection in the brain, uh, for obvious reasons. 
uh, but I, I, can't, I can't tell you that there haven't been bacterial species identified up there or viruses. I'm sure there are many to be discovered that have yet to be identified. Okay. Everybody's hanging in there really well, so we're going to take a couple more questions here. Um, here's one that I think is, is, is a, a, probably a quick one, but we'll see. Uh, how long until we forget about toothbrushes and just use bio-programmed bacteria in mouthwash? I love that question. I, I encourage the novophage guys to focus on two applications. One was toothpaste. So you'd have the bacteriophage, you go in, so you get rid of your plaque. And two was to go after body odor. Turns out that your body odor on your arms, it's bacterial. Sometimes fungal, but it's primarily bacteria. Uh, I can tell you the novophage did not get interest from the invest, investor community for either of those applications. <laughs> VCs, if there are any here, you generally want to save the world. They didn't view toothpaste or deodorant saving the world. Uh, that being said, I don't, think, I, I don't think it's that far off. Bacteriophage have become very popular. Just so you know, it's not a, a new idea. Bacteriophage were used by the Soviets for decades, when they were the Soviets, for decades as part of healthcare. They primarily use it on their, their soldiers as prime antibacterial. And it's been bubbling up, and I think it's part of what held back the development of it as a true therapeutic, because it was you, well, they weren't doing proper clinical trials, and it's the Soviets. But it's had a resurgence. There are now a number of companies that are coming up. So I, I think we could see, and I think it's a great idea, great application. I encourage everybody to keep thinking about these sorts of applications because some kind of sound silly. That's not silly. But I think it's how you can bubble up new ideas, and it's a field, as I said, that's waiting for these to take off. Okay. Uh, I think we're going to take a couple more questions here. Um, one is... How do you think that the structure of the pharma industry needs to change to enable low-cost synthetic biology? Oh. That's a, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I'm, not a, I, I'm not a big knock on pharma. I, I gave the comment on Viagra, I don't care for that practice. I, I interact a lot with pharma. I think they have some of the smartest people around working in them. I think they're doing a good job. I think one of the big things that needs to happen within pharma, for anybody who interacts with them, is that they need a much stronger interaction between the biology and the chemists. That they don't talk. And so that most of what's happening is that they're rushing to try to get the small molecule, the drug, into practice. And as a result, they're just saying, okay, I got, let's, chemists, let's run. And they, they ditch all this marvelous development in biology that could be harnessed to make better, more effective, safer drugs, including those based on, as you say, low-cost synthetic biology. An area that I did not talk about, which is one of my favorite new products in synthetic biology, is we're working in the same scheme. We're now working with Novartis on a microbial war project. So it's the only project in my lab where we're trying to find new antibiotics. So what we're trying to do is systematize Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin. So what he did was he had a plate of bacteria. He left it out by accident. He went home, I think it was near the window. He came back the next day and, oh, it was contaminated. A spore had come in, messed up his bacteria, his plate. Normally, just thrown, ah, oh, damn, you know, that's another one lost. He looks and he says, oh, I look, and he sees that near where the spore landed, the bacteria died. And so the spore, the, the yeast, had produced the substance he was able to isolate, it was penicillin. What we're now doing is setting up systematically, and we think this is a low-cost symbio idea, and Novartis is latching onto it. We're pitting microbe against microbe to see who wins. We then are looking to see whoever wins. Are they producing a small molecule? Most antibiotics are natural products. They're extracted from other microbes. They're extracted from plants. They're extracted from insects that are used to kill off the bacteria. For those that win, we see, do they produce a small molecule and can you screen it? So, for example, we pitted E. coli against Canada. Canada's a nasty yeast infection. E. coli always wins. Canada's bigger, meaner. E. coli always beats it, and E. coli produces a small molecule. And we're working with Novartis to try to isolate the small molecule. And our hope, our plan is to then have a panel of a thousand or so microbes so that when you have the New Delhi strain or the E. coli of the sprouts from Germany or the listeria on the cantaloupe, you bring it in, or MRSA or, or vancomycin resistant endococci, pit them against your panel and see who wins, and if so, are they producing a small molecule to be valuable? We're really hopeful that this would be a low-cost synbio use in pharma, and... To Novartis' credit, they latched right onto it and are now working with us to co-develop it. Great. Okay. Um, 
This is an interesting one. Can you trigger programmed cells with nervous system signals, enabling a host to control them? Uh, so this goes back also to controlling humans. So could you program cells? Uh, yes, yeah, so absolutely you could program cells to respond to different neurotransmitters and respond. Um, people, for example, related, only close related, have recently published work where they've programmed neurons to respond to light. So my colleague Martin Fusenager had it so that you could now send light and trigger and it would produce a response. So in principle you could now program other cells to respond specifically to the neural signal. The challenge there is then how to train the patient to get this because, look, these cells are still incredibly tiny in scheme. Uh, but the eventual idea of using your brain or part of your periphery to control, I don't think is out of the realm of possibility. But it's faced with a lot of challenges of specificity because your body is basically a bag filled with fluid with a bunch of different chemicals flying around. And it's a big challenge to get the chemical of interest in suitable quantity in the location you need to affect the change that you want. So there's where the challenge would be to kind of program these biological responses. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's just take this one last question, which is, how do you avoid mutations? That, that's a fascinating question. So there's uh, one interesting comment that my colleague Stuart Levy made on the bacterial side is, dead bacteria don't mutate. Right? So for the big challenge on the antibiotic side, but if we kill those guys off, boom, we solve our problem. It's the ones that survive that make it, make it more problematic. Uh, you know, mutation, the ability to mutate is a beautiful function of cells, enabling them to respond to different stresses, adapt, find within their mutation space opportunity to, to uh, escape. You can modify the ability to mutate by deleting certain genes and thereby suppress or reduce the mutation rate. That is one effort that's strongly underway within synthetic biology, specifically to get around this problem that I alluded to, which is when we put this stuff in, the cells don't like it. And if you want to put this in the body, you want to put it in the environment, you want it to last, you don't want it to mutate pretty quickly and then lose its function. And so there's a big effort underway to reduce the ability of cells to mutate, specifically so that you have a cell that can be reprogrammed stably and last. So you can, as I say, target specific genes mutate those and or eliminate them and boom, you reduce the ability to mutate. There'll always be some ability to mutate because outside signals can also mutate, like the sunlight can come in and cause your DNA to be mutated. Thank you. Yeah.